the fascism in all right this meeting is being recorded <laughs> got it the rise of fascism in the 20th century it's not going to be many laughs in this i'll tell you right so this is what we're going to do first um an outline of uh, fascism and that's some sort of definition historical roots the fascism and look at a quick look at world war one and aftermath not very quick then we'll look at italy germany and if we've got time other countries and then some sort of conclusion right so a definition the problem with fascism is that um it uses rhetoric and policies and ideas and it'll just have a grab bag of stuff and sometimes it's contradictory so it's hard to pin down sometimes but these are the basics of it uh absolute power of the state a strong centralized state total control over all parts of society and individuals give up their rights and needs to the um, their rights to the needs of the state a rule by a dictator uh usually a charismatic or magnetic personality. And he, I don't think he's ever been a she, um, always makes good decisions, important ones anyway. Corporatism. This is, there's a definition underneath there uh, of corporatism. It's basically everything becomes controlled um, the economy becomes controlled by, by the state. So uh, factory owners, unions, etc., are all in basically the same situation and strikes and anything else, labor uh, disputes are illegal. Extreme nationalism, um, national glory, fear of outside uh, threats and they build a new society, often on uh, national myths. And um, they use that for guidance instead of uh, what they call barren intellectualism, uh, like science and reason and stuff. Superiority of the nation's people. Of course, every nation's people are obviously the best ones on earth and everybody else needs to be dominated by them, especially any minority groups within the nation. Uh, militarism and imperialism. Uh, basically, great nations show their great by conquering and ruling weak nations. So the conditions. These are sort of general conditions um, to allow fascism to flourish. A sense of national victimization, being feeling that your nation is being suppressed in some way. Suppose external or internal enemies, you know, the enemy within, uh, there's always somebody who can, who's outside who you can um, say is a threat. Economic distress in times of depression or uh, hyperinflation and that. The failure of a democratic institution to solve mainly economic or social problems and the feeling that you need a radical change. A fear of left-wing ideological and cultural influence, you know, those damn socialists and communists spreading their ideas. And there's also an ethos of military conflict and um, making uh, the nation more military-minded. So if we go for the ideological roots, what you can say is these are nationalism, imperialism, military, militarism, race theory, usually um, about one race being superior to the other in some way, especially with anti-Semitism in Europe, and social Darwinism is using Darwin's uh, origin of the species and or his theory about animals and applying it to whole nations. So uh, it's survival of the fittest and the fittest nation wins. So the, the roots are really, the, the main bit is in late 19th century France, which the French don't like to admit to a lot, but there you go. 
They were defeated in the Fran Franco-Prussian War in 1871. Uh, Napoleon III was exiled and there was a third republic proclaimed. But at the same time, in the Hall of Versailles, the unified German Empire was, uh, was proclaimed. And it included the French, well, French provinces of Alsace and Lorraine. The political right in, French, in, in, in France looked to the French army as the organization which they would recover the lost territory and restore their honor. And it, it became an obsession uh, to combine revenge and the glorification of the army and war with the rejection of uh, the Republic as it is it the third Republic. So they began an emphasis on the sacred nature of um, French national community. If you're French by birth, ancestry and culture, and you have spiritual ties to the French territory. And this was uh, known as blood and soil. And it meant that anybody who lived in France who they didn't consider truly French, such as immigrants and especially racial others like Jews, they were said to undermine French national power and uh, corrode the nation from within. And in, in this climate, anti-Semitism grew to frightening levels and the demands for Jews to be ejected from the country or have their political rights removed. In 1894, there was a, um, an army captain, Alfred Dreyfus, who was accused of giving military secrets to the Germans. And he was tried for treason and found guilty. But he was found guilty mainly because he was Jewish and that his accusers assumed he must be guilty. Eventually, the real person uh, was found, but the French army refused to admit their mistake, and the, cult, the real person was actually acquitted in court. And so this polarised nation between those who thought Dreyfus should be uh, pardoned and those who insisted on his guilt. Um, he was eventually cleared in 1906, but what it did is it brought in, into focus how uh, the French right um, saw how things should be going. And that this, in 1889, France actually came close to seeing a military coup and a proto-fascist dictatorship take power. Uh, on, with the classic ideas of anti-democracy, anti-Semitism, nationalism and militarism, etc. Then came the Great War. Uh, four years of slaughter of the people of Europe and they became, and they became totally disillusioned with people in power. There was a revolution in Russia, new states emerged from the old empires. But for many, the armistice in November 1918, there was no peace. It, the conflicts continued as various new countries and groups vied for land and power. The idea was that everyone was to have self-determination, well, in Europe anyway, it didn't extend to the, the rest of the world. But it was tricky to put into practice due to the the complex mix of people in Europe at this time. Various groups and countries felt they were being shortchanged and that the three great powers, uh, Britain, United States and France, were simply making decisions in their own national and economic interests, which is pretty true. And uh, the ideas of the League of Nations sort of dissipated quite quickly in uh, post-war reality. Italy. Well, nowhere was this felt more than in Italy. Italy were on the winning side. The unification had been achieved in 1870. And from 1882, they were actually in an alliance with Germany and Austria, Hungary, even though there was a, a few disputes between the Austrians and Italians. Many Italians believed in irredentism, and it's the idea that there were still areas that rightly belonged within the Italian borders 
as they were ethnically Italian. Of some, they were historically part of the Italian present uh, province in uh, Roman times, so going way back. When the Great War actually began, Italy were neutral. The majority of Italians uh, supported this, but there was a large minority who wanted to join the war on the side of the Allies, and a smaller minority who supported Germany and Austria. The Italian government entered secret talks with the British and French, at the same time having secret talks with the Germans. They decided that Britain and France offered a better deal, and so they signed the Treaty of London and entered the war on 1915, in 1915 on the promise of territory. But politically, economically, and military, Italy was ill-prepared for war, and they had hopes of defeating the Austria-Hungary, Austria -Hungary. but it, that soon vanished, and the result was horrendous casualties for the next three years. At the end of the war, Italy was actually one of the big four, the others being the US, Britain and France, who, who was supposed to decide the borders of Europe and beyond. Italy always felt it was a junior partner, which it was. And contrary to what had been offered in the Treaty of London, uh, they got very little. The British and French also decided to uh, divide up German overseas colonies between themselves and Italy got none and they also carved up the Ottoman Empire despite Italy being promised some land as you can see there the green part of the uh, map there. So along comes Mussolini. He was a member of the Italian Socialist Party before the war an editor of his newspaper, Avanti. When the war began, he was actually at odds with the party that supported neutrality. He wanted intervention and he was expelled. So he founded his own paper advocating militarism and irredentism. And he received backing from major companies, especially from the sugar and electrical industries who, were, who wanted to join the war for their own reasons. The paper also received subsidies from government uh, back sources in France. And later on, his views were developing, and he was given a hundred pound weekly wage, which is the equivalent of around seven thousand pounds a day from MI5 to continue to publish pro war propaganda and oppose anti war protesters. As for Mussolini, Italy should follow, a, he said he should follow an imperious uh, policy in Africa because he actually saw black people as inferior to whites. And he claimed the world was divided into a hierarchy of races, although different from the way uh, Hitler and those saw it, he justified it on cultural rather than biological grounds. And he said history was nothing more than a Darwinian struggle for power and territory between these races. Anti-Semitism was not part of his philosophy. Partly, and one of the reasons was one of the main architects of fascist theory, Margarita Safati, was actually Jewish, as well as being his mistress, Sam. During 1920, there was a, a wave of strikes and factory occupations. And amongst the big business and landing class, there was a fear that the rapidly growing union would start to demand more than just improvements in wage and conditions. There was attempts by the government to uh, raise taxes and clamp down on tax avoidance uh, by the rich, because um, Italy had a huge war debt. So there was alienation between the wealthy and the government. Armed squads of veterans, war veterans called black shirts, because they wore black shirts, or squadistri in, in Italian, clash with communist, socialists and anarchists at parades and demonstrations. 
The black shirts grew rapidly as did the level of violence. The membership uh, consisted mainly of men whose political whose politics were nationalistic and anti-socialist, but little else. But there was also a fair proportion that were totally apolitical and were in it just for the violence. They were rarely interfered with by the police and received the tacit support of the wealthy. The main opposition to the black shirts came from the Adriti del Popolo, I'm probably murdering that, the people's daring ones, this was a militant anti-fascist group that gathered over 20,000 members by the summer of 1921. Although composed of socialists, anarchists and communists, they were not supported by the Italian Socialist Party, who eventually signed a pact of pacification with the Fascist Party, or by the Communist Party of Italy, who wanted to form, form their own group that they could dominate. This faithfully weakened the movement and eventually succumbed to the black shirts who had, who had assassinated or detained most of its leaders. There was a series of weak coalition governments who were unable or unwilling to contain the growing violence. Even Matt Mussolini became concerned with the actions of the black shirts and he sought to rein them in by forming the National Fascist Party to legitimize the movement and gain seats in the Italian parliament. Although the black shirt squad, some of them were a bit disapproving, this meant increased funding for Mussolini and, and his party gained gap parliamentary seats. The fascist powerful friends saw, saw them as useful in the battle against the left and advocated their entry into government rather than the creation of a specifically fascist government as a way of keeping them under control. Mussolini encouraged the belief that he would serve under somebody else in their government, reinforcing the image that uh, fascism was being transformed into a more conventional political force. In fact, by mid-October, the blueprints of a more dramatic plan were dr drawn up. This was the March on Rome. A series of, of meetings with leading fascists, Mussolini developed a scheme to seize power. Public buildings and key sites in main cities were to be occupied by the black shirts and local risings would be accompanied by a three pronged March on Rome during the night of October 27th. After some hesitation, the government asked the king, Victoria Emmanuel, to declare martial law. He initially agreed, but then quickly changed his mind. He feared fascist influence in the army, but he also had a well-known contempt for government. As a result, the army was never called on to suppress the fascist uprising. But Mussolini had never actually intended to be any, that there should be any serious fighting. There were many military figures who were actually sympathetic to the fascists, but he knew that the 30,000 or so black shirts couldn't defeat the Italian army. The March on Rome was a bit of a, a theatrical production. He, Mussolini actually waited in the wings while events in, unfolded. He remained in Milan, close to the Swiss border, just in case. He could have been arrested by the local prefect if, he, if he, the orders had been obeyed at the beginning. Um, his plan could have been seriously disrupted if there had been a sustained left-wing show of counterforce. But as the, uh, I said before, the, um, they were fatally weakened and demoralized. Mussolini, contrary to all the paintings that there is of it, actually travelled by rail overnight to Rome. And when he arrived there, it was clear he would accept nothing short of being prime minister. So he formed a national government. He had 10 non-fascists in the 14-man cabinet and he called it and 
Mussolini, though, was eager to focus as much power in his own hands as possible. As you can see, head of government, foreign affairs and the interior, three very major um, portfolios. Setting, setting what was become a pattern for subsequent fascist administrations, he, he, uh, he at first, he, he embraced free market economic, economic policies and but was granted emergency powers to reform the tax system, achieve economies and reorganize public services. Liberal intellectuals and liberal nationalists started to be attracted to the fascists, seeing them as able to provide a strong state that was necessary to give direction to a country that was characterized by social divisions and parochialism. The fascists were seen as a vigorous new elite, which was in the process of re replacing an inept one and saw fascism as a continuation of the struggle between idealism of the liberals and materialism of the socialists. The fascist party was still a minority in the Italian parliament and Mussolini decided to prepare a new electoral law. This proposed that any party or alliance gaining at least 25% of the vote would receive two thirds of the seats. And a combination of fascist intimidation and self interest on the part of the various centre right parties led to the passing of the bill. At the beginning of 1924, Mussolini dissolved Parliament and in the April elections under the, uh, were held under the new system. A combination of fraud and intimidation that went far beyond even previous Italian elections saw Mussolini's fascists together with a smaller Allied party in 66% of the vote. After the election, of course, Mussolini closed opposition newspapers and banned public protest meetings. He then declared all political parties illegal, except for his own, and he outlawed all unions and strikes. He also established a political police force, um, which was called the Organization for the Vigilance and Repression of Anti-Fascism, secret police. Uh, and that was it. Everything was just rubber stamped on his say so. So he became Il Duce, the leader. He delivered emotional public spe speeches. You've probably seen film of him. Uh, the, the crowds used to chant back slogans such as Il Duce is always right, believe, obey and fight. And he began to use the word totalitarianism for his, uh, what he was doing understanding it to mean the will of a great leader bringing about the total uh, social and political transformation of society. Mussolini um, repeatedly made comparisons to ancient Rome. Um, the fascist party organized youth organizations for all boys and girls between eight and 18. And these groups uh, promoted physical training and military drills for the boys and uh, and fostered the idea the ideals of the fascist state. Mussolini had little use for religion. However, Italy was a strongly Catholic country. Catholic doctrine continued to be taught in elementary schools, but was replaced with philosophy at the secondary le level. The Catholic Church objected to this. Mussolini was hoping to keep the church on side. So he adopted pro-Catholic policies against abortion and divorce. Then in 1929, he signed a, tr a treaty with the church that made Catholicism the state of religion. This agreement also restored teaching of the Catholic doctrine in secondary schools. For its part, the church accepted Mussolini's fascist state and ended its involvement in Italy's political affairs. 
Then we come to Germany. Like Italy, the United German State had only existed since the 1870s. When, um, since its foundation, though, it had become the industrial, technological and scientific giant of Europe. And by 1913, Germany was the largest econ economy in, in continental Europe and the third largest in the world. And German factories were larger and more modern than their British and French counterparts. But the World War I saw revolution and chaos in Germany and the eventual founding of the Weimar Republic in 1918. One important aspect of, of the rise of German fascism is the stab in the back myth. By September 1918, Field Marshal Paul von Hindenburg and his Chief of General Staff, General Erich Ludendorff, knew that the German army was defeated. Since, 19, since 1916, Germany had been effectively under military dictatorship with Hindenburg as a figurehead and Ludendorff wielding the real power. They told Kaiser Wilhelm that he needed um, to hand over power to a civilian government to ask the Allies for an armistice and leave this new government to negotiate the peace. The heavily uh, censored German press had carried nothing but news of victories throughout the war. And in 1918, the German army still occupied parts of France and Belgium, as well as large areas of the former Russian Empire. So it was no wonder that the German public was mystified by the, this request for an armistice, especially as they didn't know that Hindenburg and Ludendorff had asked for it. Nor did they know that the German army may have been in full retreat since the last so-called peace offensive had failed in early 1918. Ludendorff and his memoirs of the war published in 1919, and of course, he laid the blame for defeat squarely on the politicians, nothing to do with him. Hindenburg later got a ghostwriter to write his, and like Ludendorff, no responsibility for losing the war. Hindenburg was already a national hero, and his, his, uh, his memoirs sort of strengthened his position as uh, Germany's most popular person. There was an inquiry made uh, on the conduct of the war by the Weimar government. It wanted to call Ludendorff to testify, but not Hindenburg because Hindenburg was too popular. However, Ludendorff refused to attend unless accompanied by Hindenburg. So they both went. And at the, at the inquiry, Hindenburg just basically stared down the politicians and he refused to answer and he wouldn't even speak, he wouldn't answer questions. And then he read out a, a prepared statement that was actually written by Ludendorff. And he claimed that the war was not lost militarily but by politicians, socialists, communists, and others on the home front. The most telling phrase was the claim that Hindenburg said, an English general had said to him that they had been stabbed in the back. This is not true at all, but when you had him and Ludendorff saying it, the public uh, had an immediate effect on them. And from this moment, the myth became believed by many people. And in many versions, the guiding hand behind it was the Jews, who somehow managed to control both the bankers, the politicians, and the communists to bring about defeat. The Freikorps, literally free corps, were paramilitary groups formed in the immediate aftermath of the armistice as a response to the revolutionary uprising of the left. The majority of returning soldiers in late 1918 just wanted to return home, but a significant minority decided to retain their uniform, weapons and equipment and enlist in the various Freikorps militia units that would have been established by right-wing army officers. 
These Freikorps volunteers were overwhelmingly nationalist, anti-communist, anti-democratic, and in many cases, bulkish in their politics. Bulkish is a term that describes a racist, anti-Semitic, intensely German far-right worldview built on racial superiority and the ancient German blood and soil. And it's also aggressively nationalistic. The ranks of these ex-soldiers were swelled by patriotic students and teenagers. The formative years were shaped by the Great War and the propaganda of duty and sacrifice. Universities, which were quite elite uh, institutions still, were a hotbed for this. Um, they now relished the opportunity to fight an internal foe alongside their heroes. Veterans of the Freikorps would dominate the German far right in, for years to come, and the early Nazi party was essentially an am amalgamation of these para paramilitary elements with uh, Volkish pseudo-intellectuals. <laughs> the Freikorps grew in early 1919 due to the active support and endorsement of their activities by both the military and the social democratic government, which used them to tame any prospects of revolution. The need for the Freikorps troops uh, was because the German army, the, the ones who were left in the German army had no interest in fighting their fellow countrymen. They were just tired and weary of it. So the German uh, military actually built up a new army from scratch with an essential uh, component being the Freikorps. Now Ludendorff had gathered round him a small but growing circle of right-wing figures who shared the Volkish out outlook. He was central in coming in the com uh, to the coming nationalist coup attempt that was to be known as a cat putsch after Wolfgang, Wolfgang Kapp, who declared himself the Chancellor. No one else on the far right had Ludendorff's clout or prestige, and he had contacts in both military and civilian world. So he was the one who tied together the disparate strands of the conspiracy. The putsch failed, partly to, to incompetence, but also mainly because of a general strike that paralysed Berlin. And the, and the neutrality of most of the army. Ludendorff had been at, been at the head of the Freikorps that marched into Berlin, but he escaped any consequences as he claimed that he had merely been out for a stroll that day and didn't realise what was really happening. And they believed him. So Ludendorff and other right-wing conspiracies sought refuge in Munich. Bavaria had an extreme right-wing government with lots of sympathisers to the push. Once again, Ludendorff began writing, writing his, his more memoirs. This time, he explicitly stated that behind the, the, those responsible for the stab in the back were the Jews, and, the, and a future, in the future, a strong military leader would need to restore Germany to greatness like him. It was here that he first met Adolf Hitler, who, was be who had become a leading member of the National Socialist German Workers' Party. They immediately began to work together, each realising that other, uh, the other could be useful. Ludendorff thought he could harness Hitler's ability to speak and whip crowds into a frenzy, and Hitler needed Ludendorff's prestige and contacts, as he and the party were unknown outside nationalist circles of Bavaria. The Weimar culture. So culture wars are not just a 21st century phenomenon. They were happening in Weimar, Germany. Germany in the 1920s was probably the freest society in the world in cultural terms. Censorship was very loose. And this resulted in art, music, film, and theatre reaching new heights of experimentation and creativity. A sexual revolution took place 
with contraception, sex education, and acceptance of homosexuality and transsexuality becoming widespread, especially amongst the young. Women had gained the vote in 1918 and were now entering professions and workplaces previously denied to them, as well as attaining more equality with men in social relations and situations. Of course, there was a backlash. Um, conservative elements look back to a supposed golden age before the Great War and beyond. Thousands of tabloid papers sprung up to condemn the supposed immorality, decadence, and un-German like behavior they were seeing. They began to envision what they called a Third Reich that would return Germany to proper Teutonic values. This was attractive to the middle classes who began to support these ideas and organizations. Now that they had actually attained the vote, even middle class feminists complained of an undermining of family values and the German race, especially the falling birth rate. Like I said before, the hotbed for far right ideas existed in the universities and uh, all the professors were right wing. You couldn't get a job if, you, if your politics were of the left. And they were supported tra traditional conservative values. Most of the young adherents to the national cause were initially middle-class students from societies such as the Student du Dueling Corps. You can see there. <clears throat> Hitler's oratory and Ludendorff's contacts made the NSDAP become the, the National Socialists become major group amongst the nationalists in Bavaria. They formed the paramilitary ring, later known as the SA or Brown Shirts, that used random violence against anyone they suspected of being Jewish or socialist. There was no interference from the police as the right-wing Bavarian government gave them tacit support. Of course, they were influenced by Mussolini's black shirts and they adopted the straight arm salute that they had in Italy. Um, and they, they, they started to call Hitler the Führer, leader. And they, they used elaborate standards for their flags. The biggest influence on Hitler, though, was Mussolini's already mythologized march on Rome, and it convinced him that the tactic of a march on the capital was the quickest way to power. His chance came following a period of turmoil and political violence and a state of emergency being declared in Bavaria. This put the Bavarian government at odds with the federal government in Berlin, and Hitler in Ludendorff tried to persuade them to, to attempt a military coup. They refused, and Hitler decided to take matters into his own hands. And a large detachment of brown shirts marched on the Berger, the Berger Brackeller, where Bavarian Chancellor Karl was making a speech in front of 3,000 people. There, Hitler declared that the, the national revolution has broken out, the hall is surrounded by 600 men. Nobody is allowed to leave. He went on to state that the Bavarian and Berlin governments were deposed and declared the formation of a new government on, with Ludendorff. But then, from then on, quickly uh, events escalated beyond Hitler's control. Ludendorff had turned up in his tweed suit and ended up leading a march again on the city centre in Munich. Contrary to Ludendorff's uh, expectations, the army didn't join the putsch and it was quickly quelled. Hitler and Ludendorff went on trial, accused of high treason, with some others there at the bomb. Trouble is, many of the judges were sympathetic, and Hitler, although found guilty, received the mildest of three types of jail sentences available in German law at the time. Ludendorff was acquitted having claimed that he had sim simply gone to the beer hall for a drink. And I had no idea that a putsch was happening. He just got so swept up in the whole thing. <laughs> in 
In his rel relatively com comfortable prison, Hitler wrote Mein Kampf, part biography, part polemic. In it, he outlined his view that the Jews and communists were sources of all the world's ills. And in it, he says the destruction of the weak and sick is far more humane than their protection. And he saw the purpose in, dis in uh, destroying the weak in order to provide the proper space and purity for the strong. It was also the idea that, that the Germans needed Liebenstrom, living space in the East, a bit like the Italian uh, idea. And that was a historic destiny that would properly nurture the German people. Hitler was released from prison after only eight months and immediately began to secure his leadership and of the reformed Nazi party from Ludendorff, who had managed to gain a lot of influence with it while he was in prison. He managed to persuade Ludendorff to stand it as the Nazi party candidate in the 1925 presidential election. And this was the first one since the founding of the Weimar Republic. Hitler knew that Ludendorff had no chance of winning, but used it to discredit him. According to German law, the election would, would have been two rounds. If no one won more than 50% in the first round, which was highly unlikely given, given the German politics, then the second round would take place with the winner simply being the candidate with the most votes. Ludendorff was eliminated. He got just over 1% of the votes. Hindenburg, who refused to take part in the first round, then entered the second round as a compromise candidate of the right. And as you can see, he won. Hindenburg's election was greeted by joy by conservatives and nationalists. Surprisingly, it seemed though Hindenburg was taking a hands-off approach in the first few year, years of his presidency. But behind the scenes, he managed to use his influence to prevent the Social Democrats, who were the largest party in the Reichstag, being part of any coalition government. This left various right-wing parties to form, mi form minority governments. And in 1927, a series of scandals, the election that year saw the SDP win even more seats, and they couldn't be prevented from forming a coalition government with the more moderate DVP, Centre Party. At this time, Hitler, released from pri prison, strengthened his control of the Nazi Party and decided, a bit like Mussolini, that they should now participate in elections while at the same time continuing with street politics as the brown shirts. And it was at this time that he actually formed the Schutzstaber, or SS, which was an elite group within the Nazi party of even more uh, dedicated uh, members. Ludendorff had left the party with his new wife and he formed a new group that was uh, regarded by the Nazis as being too extreme. So you can just imagine what it was like. Then came the Wall Street crash of 29. And this brought down the, the uh, social democratic led government. And the period 1930 to 33 was one of dire political and economic crisis for Germany. And Hindenburg found himself at the very center of it. His solution, along with his small circle of advisors, all military men, uh, was to move further to the political right with the long-term aim of restructuring the Republic in a manner which would favour the military, industrial and landowning elite. According to the Weimar Constitution, the president could rule by decree in the event of an emergency. Now, what constituted an emergency was ill-defined and was up to the president, really. And from 1930 onwards, Hindenburg would experiment with less democratic and more authoritarian style of government, using and abusing his emergency powers. It was basically ruled by decree. In 1928, the Nazi party had, had 
had just 2.6% of the vote. But the, the effects of the depression and the bickering and fragmenting of the right-wing parties had seen a growth in their popularity. In the election of September 1930, the major right-wing parties and the SDP lost seats. The communist KDP gained seats, and, um, but the Nazi party surged from just 12 to 107, becoming the second biggest party in the Reichstag behind the SDP, SPD. This success took the Nazis' rivals by surprise. The onset of the Great Depression had obviously had an impact on the German voters. And Nazi support was strongest amongst those who had suffered in recent years, like farmers, small business owners, craftsmen, and lower civil servants who had seen their salaries slashed. But what the Weimar parties couldn't grasp was a huge element of the Nazis' appeal was those disillusioned with democracy, the party system, and parliament itself, especially the lower middle class who flocked to the nationalism in the face of the apparent failure of the right of the liberal democratic order. The Catholic and industrial working class communities have been mostly immune to the Nazis' appeal. But the party made very considerable gains in Protestant Germany, especially in the rural North and East. After the 1930 election, a centre-right minority government ruled with the passive support of the SDP, both fearing the Nazis. By 1932, this was no longer sustainable as industrialists and nationalists were insisting on austerity methods, such as severely cutting Germany's welfare position provisions as price for any support. The nationalist far right was now firmly under control of the Nazi party as other minor parties dissolved themselves into it. 1932 election saw Hindenburg, who was now 84, running against Hitler. Hindenburg won after the second ballot due to his mainly just continued popularity. Hindenburg wasn't pleased though. Firstly, he was annoyed that he had taken two ballots. He saw that as an insult. And secondly, his support had come from the left and the centre Catholic parties, both of whom he despised. The people who he wished to be the leader of the nationalist far right had voted for Hitler. Throughout 1932, various elections were held, both national and local. The Nazis were gaining seats and, the, and were invited to join in a coalition government on several occasions. Hitler always demanded that his condition was to be made chancellor. Hindenburg and others at first did not agree. But the situation came to a head in the general election of, 9, of November 1932 when although the Nazis actually lost seats, it remained the largest party in the Reichstag, then the Reichstag, with a lot of main gains going to the communist KDP. This, this uh, made things a bit different for Hindenburg, and after several rounds of negotiations, he was made, Hitler was made chancellor in January 1933. And he was nominally the head of a national government, with the majority of the cabinet being non-fascist, which is another parallel to what happened in, in Italy. But Hitler had insisted on the Prussian and Reich interior ministries being held by Nazi party members, and he had this chancellorship. And he also wanted his cabinet to rule by decree, which Hindenburg had been doing. And Andy wanted a new general election. Hindenburg was only too glad to hand over the reins of power to Hitler, having in his mind finally united the far right in a majority government. The March 1933 campaign was fought in a highly charged atmosphere. There was Nazi terror, intimidation and harassment with police assistance now that the Nazis control both the Prussian and Reich interior ministries. And they, uh, 
this was mainly turned against the communists and social democrats as well as the center party despite achieving a much better result the nazis didn't do as well as hitler had hoped in spite of massive violence and voter intimidation they won 43 43.9% uh, of the vote so didn't get a majority Therefore, Hitler was forced to maintain his coalition to control the majority of seats. Although the KDP, the communists, had not been formally banned, it was a foregone conclusion that the KDP deputies would never be allowed to take their seats. And within a few days, all, all, all the leadership had been either placed under arrest or gone into hiding. Although the Nazi coalition had enough seats to conduct basic business of government, Hitler needed a two-thirds majority to pass what he called the Enabling Act, which allowed the cabinet, effectively the Chancellor, Hitler, to enact laws without the approval of the Reichstag for four years. Leaving nothing to chance, Hitler's use of provision, the provision, uh, what happened is the Reichstag caught fire, and there was a, a Reichstag fire decree and arrested all 81 communist deputies and, and we're able to keep uh, lots of social democrats out of, the, out of the chamber. Hitler then obtained the necessary majority uh, by pers persuaded by, by simply not having much of an opposition. Um, only a few social democrats who managed to turn up opposed the measure and it became into effect on the 27th of March. The bill's provisions turned the government into a de facto legal dictatorship. Within four months, the other parties have been neutralized or, and by outright banning on Nazi terror, and Germany had become formally a one party state. If I have a just quick look at fascism in other countries. Uh, besides Italy and Germany, other European countries had fascist or semi-fascist regimes in the 1930s. And those that survived the Second World War, like Portugal and Franco-Spain, soon distanced themselves from the ideology after 1945. In fact, most of the Eastern Europe countries, Poland, Romania, Hungary, etc., were under some sort of neo-fascist or authoritarian government. There was also a lot of fascist movements and um, parties in other countries, including Britain. And, uh, uh, but we didn't really get very far. Um, the British Union of Fascists and the Imperial uh, Fascist League. And uh, I've got, that's a, just a picture there of uh, one of the reasons it didn't get far. That's uh, the Battle of Cable Street when EastEnders and London stood up against a, a proposed fascist march through, through, through um, the East End. So the conclusion. <laughs> so we know the outcome, 50 million deaths in World War II and genocide. Of course, none of the fascist parties explicitly stated their final objectives, and many of them had little idea where it would lead, but all were prepared to use any means necessary to achieve their goals. The first Nazi concentration camps was not built to house Jews, but for political enemies, communist, socialist, anarchists, and trade unionists. At each step, those in power thought they could use Mussolini and Hitler for their own ends, but ended up being subservient to them. Their opponents often underestimated their willingness to use force and manipulation to gain power. Hitler had actually written it down in Mein Kampf, but people just refuse to believe that's what he really meant that, that he wrote, you know, he, he would moderate it. But they were wrong. Okay, we'll finish with a little song. without a trace but battalions of fascists still dream of a master race the history books they tell of their defeat in 45 
Until 